And so there I was, enjoying those darker evenings spent knitting, chillier nights where you're cracking out the hand-knit socks, colder days where you've got beautiful leaves changing and rustling and pumpkin spices all the places, all the time, you know, really embracing Novembering. And then I wake up one morning and bam, it's December and it's all twinkly lights and advent calendars and gift knitting and all of the things that I did not see this coming. I mean, I did because calendars are a thing and, but it's a lot. <laughs> Pickles and welcome to episode 34 of the Vicarious Knitting Podcast. My name is Caroline, I'm found more commonly across Instagram and Ravelry as Dunderknit. If this is your first time joining us here on the podcast, a huge hello and welcome to you. A very brief word of warning up front just to let you know, as ever, that this is a swearing friendly podcast and therefore there's a bit of cursing, a bit of occasionally slightly less couth language, shall we say, but it's very much just how we conduct ourselves over here in this little corner of the internet. If that's not your bag, I totally appreciate it. Thank you so much for checking us out, but this won't be the podcast for you. However, if you have been around here for a little while now, or indeed you're just happy and willing to embrace all of the sweariness, it is delightful to have you here, and I really do hope that you're well. There's really no getting away from it. It is December and as such, festivities have descended from on high. I mean, depending on the part of the world that you're in and depending how commercialised your general day-to-day -day life is, it may have been bedding in for quite some time now. I have the dubious honour of working on an office just off Oxford Street, which is the main shopping thoroughfare here in London. And as such, Christmas has been thoroughly rammed down my throat <laughs> for at least the last few weeks increasingly. Um, we've had Christmas lights start to go on, we've had some beautiful decorations start to go up in stores, and as such we are well and truly getting into the festive spirit. I have therefore joined in with the traditional, um, I say traditional, it's been a whole, you know, one other year that we've done this now, but you know, let's call it traditional. I have the customary stash decorations up here, I have my little hat and glove lights and my little twinkly sock lights. I did realise, and this is how much of a just general pedant I am, a little bit too late that I had switched them um, because this is, I'm telling you too much about myself too early in this podcast, but there we go. Um, so the sock lights I would usually put on the top shelf here because the shelf up here that you can't quite see, this row at the top is where all my sock yarn lives and then this is generally the yarn that I use for like hats and accessories on the middle shelf and I am that kind of douchebag. Um, but anyway, there we go. I realised it a little bit too late. I'm going to try and live with it for a bit. You might come back next time and find they've been switched. It just depends how much my kind of inner nerd battles it out with my inner sloth. So we'll see how that goes. <laughs> The particularly eagle-eyed amongst you may have spotted this little festive nook over here. I have my little felted reindeer friend and they are stood next to a yarny advent calendar. And you may well know that this can mean only one thing. Yes, I have a yarny advent calendar for this year. Uh, this is the third year that I've bought a yarn advent calendar from Nora George. I love her advents. Um, I haven't gone quite as overboard as I did last year. So last Last year I had three calendars that I was opening, not because I bought all three, or rather I had, but not for one year. Um, last year I had a calendar from Nora George and a calendar from Cat Sandwich Fibres, and then discovered part way through December that I actually also had forgotten about a calendar that I'd bought the year before. It had arrived quite late. Um, it ended up arriving in February, which was right bang smack in the middle of kind of divorce and move. And as such, it all got very kind of confusing. And I forgot about it until partway through December last year, when I realized that actually I should open that in parallel, which I then did. Um, 
those of you who are familiar with that story are probably familiar with it because you watched my Vlogmas from last year. Vlogmas to anyone who is unaware. Uh, you may well have heard the term being bandied around fairly, fairly frequently over the last few weeks. It is a regular vlogging challenge. It invites people, you don't have to have a YouTube channel, you don't have to have a podcast. It invites anyone who chooses to do so to regularly vlog in the run-up um, to Christmas Day throughout Advent. Obviously, other holidays are also available. Um, I know a few people used uh, the vlogging challenge around Hanukkah, for instance, and just celebrated December more broadly. Um, but the majority of people, I believe, run um, Vlogmas as a challenge throughout Advent, so in the days leading up to Christmas, whether or not you celebrate that as a religious holiday notwithstanding. Now, I took part in Vlogmas last year. I had not long been podcasting, so it was a great opportunity to get myself more familiar with both my camera and my editing software. It was a great opportunity to play with the format a little outside of the regular podcast and be a bit more creative and a bit sillier, to be honest, um, with a lot of the things that I was doing. And crucially, I was kind of in between full-time jobs at the time. I'd finished up with a previous company the month prior. I was doing a little bit of work and kind of small prep and so on throughout the month of December last year, but actually I didn't have a day job. And so as such, I was able to not only kind of spend time creating content, but also go to lots of fun places that allowed me to capture that content in the first case. And um, somewhat unfortunately, more so for, for anyone who has aspersions to watch a similar Vlogmas again, less so for me financially, I do have a day job this year and that is going to make um, reaching the uh, creative echelons that I had last year with my Vlogmas a little bit more challenging. And so as such, I am still hoping to do a little bit of gentle vlogging throughout December. It certainly won't be daily, but I'm hoping to have a few snippets and things to share with you. It may end up being a weekly vlog, in which case I will chop together a few things from throughout the week. Um, not necessarily every day, because there will be some days that will be tremendously boring for you <laughs> as I commute to work and commute home from work and plop gently onto the sofa and stare into the abyss for a number of hours. <laughs> you know, Tuesdays. That's what I mean. But um, as such, I do want to ensure that I'm sharing a little bit of what I'm doing in the run up to Christmas. And therefore, I will make sure that those are available on my channel. As I say, it won't be daily. If you do really want some daily content, one, there are a plethora of other amazing individuals who are doing Vlogmas this year from within the knitting and general crafty community. Um, there are lots, lots here in the UK. There are others elsewhere overseas. I would highly encourage you to have a little bit of a look around, either on YouTube by searching for Vlogmas and maybe knitting or crocheting, or indeed over on Instagram. Instagram because I know a few people have been talking about it there too. So I highly encourage you to look at that content and if you are really really keen for whatever madcap reason of your own you may have to enjoy a daily dose of um, me and all the daft things that I get up to you are of course more than welcome to watch last year's Vlogmas, if that really strikes your fancy. Um, I did have some amazing feedback about it. I'm incredibly grateful to those of you who did stick it out and who watched the entire month's worth. You are wonderful individuals and you were incredibly kind and generous with your feedback. So thank you so much for that. And um, yeah, I hope to bring you a few more highlights throughout this month albeit on a slightly more reduced schedule. I will, however, be ensuring that I include opening up my advent minis. Again, it won't be daily, they'll be included as part of the weekly updates, if that's what I end up doing. I'm trying to hedge my bets, can you tell? But um, yes, I wanna make sure that you are at least kept up to speed with those. So um, I hope that satisfies your curiosity. And if it doesn't, trust me, there are a wealth of others to go out there and follow. And I really, really hope that everyone has a huge amount of fun doing it. Continuing on the subject of your amazing generosity and other tremendously talented people, I discovered this week that for the second year in a row I have been nominated for Knit Now Magazine's Knitter of the Year Awards in the online innovator category and like the grin that I'm wearing on my face right now should indicate how utterly over the moon I am that you 
took the time to go and to nominate me for it. It is an individual's nominated um, category and so uh, as indeed are all of their awards and so I am beyond grateful to you for your, your kindness, your generosity and your support. Um, the category that I'm in is absolutely jam-packed full of ridiculously amazing and talented individuals and therefore I will include a link in the description box below for you to go and to have a look at the Knit Now website where they list all of the nominated folks individually along with some detail about them. I totally urge you to go and check up on some of the other folks not only in the online innovators category but indeed all of the categories and um, just they're fucking amazing people, they really are. Thank you so much too to the folks over at Knit Now, in particular Kate Heppel for pulling together this year's awards and indeed just for doing such a sterling effort uh, and a sterling job on the magazine, the publication as a whole. It's just, it's so, I'm genuinely flummoxed and flabbergasted and lost for words, as you can probably tell, which is why I tend to fill space with drivel. Um, hence podcast, I mean, why not? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I am absolutely delighted. I really do appreciate it. One other thing, if you do go onto those pages and you notice that perhaps someone that you'd really like to vote for isn't included, the great news is that in those voting categories, you can nominate your own individuals. And so if you go there and you recognise that there's someone that you truly love in the online content or innovation creation space, you can absolutely add them in there too. So fear not, you can always ensure that your favourites are included. And last but definitely not least, before we get into our full knitting content, Thank you so much to everybody who sent me lovely get well notes last week. I did have a slightly longer hiatus than planned. I normally record every two weeks. It's been a three week turnaround this time and that is because last weekend I was in the midst of a gross and just generally snotty and just blech head cold. And as such, I didn't really want to talk for an hour. I didn't really want you to have to listen to me talk for an hour and I definitely didn't want to have to edit me down <laughs> from all of the coughing, the sneezing, the general ugh that was happening in and around my head cavities to um, yeah have to have to deal with all of that. I'm still in the slight residual phases of it. I feel fine. Thank you so much for your comments and for your well wishes. Um, but yeah, there's there's like a slightly residual glichness, but for the most part, I am feeling an awful lot better and much, much more inclined to um, want to talk at you for a longer length of time than I was this time last week, where the thought of that just made me want to sip tea and hibernate gently. <laughs> But yes, this week's episode, we're going to be talking about the blamed under knit along slightly later on. Thank you as ever for everyone who is continuing to take part and to post pictures and comments and engage with folks on Instagram, on Ravelry, everywhere that you are doing this. It makes me incredibly happy. We are going to be showcasing some of your wonderful projects slightly later on in this episode. I'm also going to be talking a little bit about some knitting that I've been doing myself. But just before I do that, as ever, show notes for this week's episode can be found in the description box below. There is a link there as well to our Ravelry group where you will find even more show notes and links to all of the things I mentioned there within Ravelry. Similarly, you can also follow us over on Instagram if that is your preference. On Instagram, I have the Knitting Vicariously account. It's specific to the podcast. You don't necessarily see all the stuff that I post in my personal account, which is mostly cats and my cat, not cats plural, geez, I wouldn't, oh good lord, I wouldn't dream of cheating on my cat and my Instagram feed, I mean, outrage. But um, yeah, so there's a little bit more kind of general day-to-day -day content that takes place over there. The Knitting Vicariously channel is more specifically around each individual episode where I'll post relevant links and hashtags to all of the makers that I mentioned in this week's episode. But we're going to kick off this week with what I am wearing and also what happens to be a finished object. Because yes, good, good pickles, I have finished up my Felix pullover. This is a pattern by Amy Christoffers. I'll put a picture of it here. It is a beautiful 
heavyweight raglan jumper with this amazing lace shaping that I'll show you properly in a second. It was inspired, or at least my version was heavily inspired by my wonderful friend Emily, who is bookcase hat over on Ravelry, or Emily Caroline over on Instagram. She had not one, but two of these sweaters knit for this year's Rhinebeck, and I coveted both of them in a way that was both lustful and deeply inappropriate. And so it, I felt it was only fair that I end up working on one of my own. I will stand up and give you a slightly better look at it because there are details here that you really need to appreciate up close. So here you have it. This is my Felix pullover. I have not yet blocked it, so I'm expecting it will grow a little bit both lengthwise and widthwise when I do get to block it, but the best and the most beautiful detail is here on these sleeves because there are these beautiful little eyelet details along the raglan that you can see there. I love them on the front, I adore them on the back. So let me just move my hair and show you, look, aren't they stunning? Aren't they absolutely beautiful? I love that detail so, so much. So um, yes, this is the Felix pullover. It is knit out of Jill Draper's Mini Empire Heathers in the lipstick colorway. I, you can see I had a slight, slight difference here in the skeins. I was alternating, but this is clearly, again, you can see kind of alternating, alternating, alternating slightly different colors. In all honesty, it's much more drastic on the camera than it is in reality, I promise you, because it's slightly overexposed here at the moment because I've got lots of dark colours up in your grill. Um, this, in, in reality, is a little bit more kind of thoroughly blended, so don't fear too much. It certainly doesn't bother me at all in real life. And I'm just going to show you this side as well because I love this detail so much. But yes, this is, as I mentioned, my Felix pullover. In terms of length, it is bang on mid-hip for me. I did lengthen it slightly from what the pattern suggests. Um, I will talk about that momentarily, but just before I do that, I mean, gratuitous boob shot partly, but also just to show you how beautiful this yarn is. Look, you get these beautiful little flecks and heathery spots and just those greys and there's more sort of saturated pinks and then there's little light neps like this one. I adore this yarn so much. So let me just sit down and I will talk you through it properly. So yes, this is my Felix pullover. It is knit with yarn that I bought at Rhinebeck this year. I bought it from Jill Draper's Open Studio. It is, as I mentioned, the Mini Empire Heathers in the lipstick colorway. Look, I've knit it up already. It's out of my stash. It doesn't even really count as a purchase, right? Because, you know, it's already a sweater. That's how this shit works. Um, but yes, I bought four skeins of this yarn at her open studio. I'm going to come back onto that in a minute because those of you who've watched previous episodes may have already jumped to conclusions about what's happened. But we're going to, let's put a pin in that and I'm going to come back to it. <laughs> But um, yes, I knit the size 45 inch bust, which should give me a couple of inches of positive ease. Now, as I mentioned, I haven't yet blocked this. I do think this yarn is going to relax a little when I do block it. I don't think it'll grow monstrously, um, but I do think it will relax a tiny bit. I mentioned last time round, I think I was struggling to find ways of describing this yarn. It's quite dense. Um, it is rambly wool, the base is Rambouillet wool, uh, wool rather, and I struggled with words, so I'm going to go with the expression that most thoroughly conveyed my uh, my thoughts about this yarn, which is this yarn, in terms of how it's spun, it's quite, uh, yeah, um, we all, we all understand where I'm going with that, right? Good, cool, just checking. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's quite a dense yarn, and as such, I do think a little bit of soaking, a little bit of laying flat, pinning, um, will definitely help this. I don't think it's going to grow monstrously, but it might just loosen ever so slightly, so that will be great. 
In terms of the details of this sweater, for the most part, the body of the sweater is knit on six millimeter needles, as are the sleeves, the edging, the ribbing, both on the neck, the cuffs, and indeed the hem of the sweater, I knit on 5.5 millimeter needles. I used my chowgoos throughout. They are my needles of choice, particularly for garment knitting, because I really like having that slightly sturdier cable with the metal core that the chowgoos have. It makes knitting so much easier. Um, although for the sleeves, I tend to go for higher highers or higher higher sharps, usually the 16 or the 12 inch circumference, um, which is my personal preference for those because it just means that sleeves can go much quicker. I can carry on knitting. I'm not a big fan of the old magic loop or indeed of DPNs. So for me, smaller circumference needles are a definite win. Um, in terms of the details, the collar is actually knit um, first, you don't pick up for stitches afterwards, you knit it at the same time as you do the body of the sweater. There's then a little bit of short row increasing and shaping at the back of the neck, just to raise that up a tad, and then you get into the raglan proper. It was a very quick knit, all things considered, partly because of the gauge that you're knitting this at. This is iron weight yarn, it is pretty substantial. Zhuzh. We've talked about this. Um, but in terms of knitting some of these parts, so I started with an alternating cable cast on for the collar, um, which I'm gonna struggle to show you, but if I sort of shuffle forward a little bit, you might just be able to see. It just means that I don't have a really kind of harsh line around my neck band here. I've got something that looks a little bit more kind of flowy and continuous. It's not a full tubular. I didn't make that commitment up front. I was far too eager to get started and going to faff around with tubular cast-ons. Um, I know I'm a bad person, but um, it does mean that similarly, when it came to doing the cuffs of the sweater and indeed the hem, I did try a little bit harder there. So the cuffs I actually ended up doing, it's, it's kind of a tubular bind off, but it's a tubular bind off where you don't separate your knits and pearls and do the kind of slipping of stitches. Now, anyone who's done a tubular bind off may know what I'm talking about. There seems to be two different ways of doing it. You can either um, create more fabric. So, sorry, let me explain this a little bit better. A tubular bind off is one that rather than creating a very kind of harsh line that goes around the bottom of your project, it tries to create more of a look where if you imagine you've got one side of ribbing here, one side of ribbing here, it tries to create a look where it's almost as though those curve over rather than it being just quite a sort of strong end line, which is what you usually get when you use a more traditional um, long tail bind off, for instance, or passing one stitch over another. Um, Tubular bind offs tend to give you a slightly more kind of continuous looking effect on the edge. It tends to be what you see with commercial knits, and as such, it's generally considered to be a more kind of, um, I guess, ready to wear style way of finishing your clothes. As such, there's a couple of different ways that you can do it. Usually with a tubular bind off, what you tend to do is you will create a little bit of extra fabric on either side of the ribbing. So perhaps your knit stitches on one side, your purl stitches on the other, and then you will actually um, usually kind of kitchener those stitches together, which is where you create more of a kind of um, flowing line between the stitches that are happening on both sides. I don't know if I'm explaining this well, but let's carry on. Um, the other way that you can do it is just by kitchening or kitchenering some of those stitches as you go. So it's not so much about creating that excess fabric, it's more just about creating um, a, a look that's probably similar to the alternating cable cast on. So to show you as an example, I actually did a one pass tubular bind off here on my cuff. Let me show you that there. Um, which is one where you just kitchener the stitches. So you do it in a slightly strange order, but you are sewing into the certain a leg of a knit stitch then kind of one stitch along you're going into a purl stitch and I'm not going to explain the directions because honestly one I can't remember them and two <laughs> I generally need to sit there and do it in absolute silence and work through step by step um so I'm going to be terrible at trying to explain them to you but um there are plenty of websites I think I used 
some instructions from Pearl Soho's website, maybe, for kind of a um, tubular bind-off, a long tail, long tail sewn tubular bind-off, um, which results in this kind of a bind-off here, which is kind of similar to what I have as my alternating cable cast on for the neck. By contrast, the hem I actually did with a full proper two-pass tubular bind-off. So let me stand up and show you that by comparison. Okay, I'm standing at a slightly odd angle for you to get this effect, but hopefully you can now see where I have used the two-pass tubular bind-off here on the hem of the sweater and how that compares to the cuff. So with the hem of the sweater, what I did is I had a couple of passes at it. So in other words, I started working the hem flat, so I went back and forth, and on the first row where I was working on the right side, I knit the knit stitches and slipped the pearls with yarn in front. On the flip side, I did the same again, but because it was on the wrong side, it was working the other side of the fabric. So I knit the knit stitches, which are pearls, on the right side here, and then slipped the others with yarn in front. I then had my knit stitches at the front and my purl stitches on the back on different needles. So you end up having one needle that takes all of these front knit stitches on it and you slip the others onto another circular needle and then kitchener it as you would do a toe on a sock. Hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> if not, there are a plethora of YouTube videos out there. Usually I go to Very Pink Knits. She is a great destination for this kind of stuff. Oops, you zoom in properly. And um, yeah, you should be able to see what the finished effect is there. So that was a very garbled explanation of how I finished off my sweater. It may have made some sense, I'm not totally sure. Um, but yes, so that is how I ended up working this for my Felix. Now, I mentioned that I bought four skeins of yarn at Jill Draper's Open Studio, and that is entirely true. However, <laughs> as I mentioned last time round, when I showed this on the last episode of the podcast, I had just separated for the sleeves, I had just finished off my second skein, and I decided that I was going to make a start on the sleeves, so I definitely had full length sleeves, and then I would come back to work on the body, because I knew that I was going to be quite tight on yarn, and I would knit the body as long as I had yarn for. Um, four skeins worth of body, obviously. Uh, I did that. I knit the sleeves, both of them. I then went back to the body. And just as I was finishing off that second sleeve and going back to the body, I got a very lovely and very helpful message from someone. And apologies because I do not remember your name, but I think it might have been a YouTube comment to say, there's one skein of lipstick left in Jill Draper's shop. Her, her online shop that ships to the UK. I mean, you have to be safe, right? <laughs> now, again, you'll know that last time when I spoke to you, I said I really don't wanna have to buy this extra skein because if I do that, then you know it's gonna have to come all this way and what's the point in it coming all this way on its own and it should probably bring some friends. Yeah, so um, without wishing to, to preempt the acquisitions section later on in this podcast, I mean, fuck it, yeah, <laughs> might have bought the extra skein, might have used it for the ribbing. Now, I think, in all honesty, I probably could have got away with just the four for this sweater, but actually, it was the difference between having a sweater that would have felt potentially slightly too short, and this is a personal preference, right? The styling of this sweater is that it's boxy and that it's a little bit cropped, just as a personal preference, I really like stuff to hit me kind of bang on mid-hip. Anything else, and I know from kind of personal experience that I'm just going to be sort of pulling it down every now and again, tugging at it ever so gently, and just kind of like, <sighs> for, for, for the comfort it will give me, for the extra wear that this is likely to get, I am very happy with my choice of buying an extra skein. Not least because it gives me some pretties to work on elsewhere. Preempting, sorry. But um, yes, so as such, this took a little bit over for skeins. I mean, maybe I broke into the first, like, fifth of the last skein. Genuinely, we're talking, what, 
12 rounds of ribbing and this tubular, well, 10 rounds of ribbing and then two rounds with the tubular bind off. So um, yeah, certainly not a huge amount of yarn used there. But um, I mean, I mean, I mean, I'm happy. But yes, thank you also to everyone who was so nice and commented on this in the previous episode when I was also wearing another slightly heathered pink raglan sweater. Apparently that's a thing now. <laughs> but yeah, I really do love this pattern. It's incredibly well written. It is quite simple. And so actually, if you were looking for a first sweater pattern or a quick sweater knit, something that is going to see you through chillier months, whether those are now or whether you're down under and you're expecting to see those in about six months time, I would definitely, definitely recommend this as a pattern. I do see myself knitting another of these partly because of the acquisition. I mean, I'm, I keep preempting it, I'm sorry. But <laughs> but yeah, I really, really enjoyed knitting this. I love the finished effect. Moving along to works in progress. I have been making a little bit of progress on my Stoker shawl, which is a pattern by Kristen Lair of Vine. I haven't made quite as much progress as I would have liked, but rest assured, it will be back in future episodes. And so I'm going to skim past that one for now. But um. I've been having a bit of a think and those of you who watch the podcast regularly will suspect that this justifies another cast on and um, I would hate to disappoint you. <laughs> oh dear. I have been having a little bit of a think about my winter accessories. Now these are probably my, wo my most worn knits on the basis of the fact I can bundle up in them on my way to work. I can wear them during my commute. They tend to be kind of everyday items that I really, really get a lot of use out of. Part of that is because they're fairly neutral. And so just to talk you through some of them at the moment, the first of these is a hat by a wonderful friend of mine in terms of the pattern. This is my Jenica hat. This is a pattern by Jen Emerson. I will be talking about it a little bit later on. But um, this is, as you say, like it's a cream hat and therefore it gets all of the wear and I absolutely adore it. The pom-pom is a pom-pom by Cowling County Crafts, sorry, Cowling Country Crafts on Etsy. There are a number of faux fur pom-pom uh, makers out there. Hers are my favourite because they come with a little customary um, clasp or, or sort of uh, popper. There we go. See? With and without the pom-pom. Um, and it just means that, you know, it's easy to take off and wash should you need it to, but it's just, it's a really nice way of securing them. So this hat, it's DK weight. I think this is a skein of Madeleine Tosh in the paper colorway, I think, in DK twist. Um, this is something I wear all the time, usually with my Belize or Belisa mitts, which is a pattern by Isolde Teague. I mentioned this in the previous episode. Uh, I knit these last Christmas, so round about episode 10, 11 ish, I would say, if you want to see a little bit more detail about those. But for these, part of the reason I love them so much is that I modified them to have this nice long cuff here. So they keep my fingers nice and toasty. Um, but again, these are quite neutral, so they go quite well together. See? See where I'm going with this? They're not matchy-matchy, but they're kind of neutral and therefore work nicely. Um, the other pairing that I'll often gravitate towards is my Straimsund hat, which you will have seen before. This is knit out of wool folk yarn. I love this hat. I love the pom-pom and the way that the wool folk yarn just created this ridiculously lovely, dense, fluffy pom. It's just, it's wonderful. Um, so I love this hat and I usually wear it with my campsite shawl, which is this beast. This is a shawl by, I believe, Alicia Plummer. It's knit in northbound knitting yarn, which is uh, a merino silk blend, so it's lovely and drapey. It's not the warmest, but it is huge. So it's quite a nice balance of something that I can wear while commuting, where it's not going to help me overheat. But at the same time, it's, you know, between that and the fact that, frankly, there are gaps for the wind in this, it's not necessarily the thing that I gravitate to on the chilliest of days. But it does match my hat, my, my Straimsund hat, quite nicely. 
you will see a bit of a theme here, which is essentially kind of neutrals with maybe a little pop of colour, yeah, um, and just being able to kind of pair them together. So I was having a bit of a think and I thought, do you know what? I'm kind of embracing the pink at the moment. I just, this and, and my um, no frills sweater that I wore in the last episode, I do really love a little bit of gentle pink in my wardrobe and I'm fine with that. And so I was thinking to myself, actually, what I'd really like is to have a couple of accessories, maybe to lift the fact that I've got a grey coat and a black coat and just kind of very neutral things. And maybe I could try and put a little bit of colour in there and just see how I go. So I've shown previously that I'm really keen at some point to cast on the um, Oak Hollow Mitts, which is a pattern by Diana Waller, um, which are the mitts that I showed on the last episode. But I do think I might be seeing a little bit of kind of mauvey dusty pink coming into those, possibly. I'm still deciding my colours, haven't cast on yet. Keep an eye out for that in future, because I think this side of Christmas it's going to happen. It'll be a thing. But to keep that company, I thought about the hat that I wear the most, which is, as we've established, my Jenica hat, which I adore. Um, and I would put it on, but it will mess up my hair, so I'm not gonna. But um, I was thinking about this and just, I've tried to find so many other patterns that I love. I keep coming back to this one. And therefore, a very long-winded way of saying, I have cast on another Jenica hat. Yes, indeed. Jenica is a pattern by the wonderful Jen Emerson. Jen has a, a huge array of patterns ranging from garments to accessories. She has some gorgeous hat patterns. She has um, some cowls. She has a sweater pattern that I've knit as well. She is a wonderful all-round designer. And uh, as I mentioned, I have cast on another Jenica hat. Now, this is living in a very special bag. This is a bag, look at the spaciness and the cat hair and the floof that's on the bottom, apologies for that, um, but this is a bag that was made for and sent to me by my wonderful friend Kalisha. She is Nadira Tani on Instagram and she has the Quirky Monday Craftcast on YouTube as well, which I will link to below. She is a wonderful human being with just the most infectiously gorgeous smile you can possibly imagine, so um, please do go and check her out if you haven't already done so, and um, keep an eye out on her um, channel for mentions of her bags as well because they are truly truly excellent but in here is my Jenica hat it is being knitted in more Rhinebeck yarn I am using up this stash before it's even properly had time to bed in to my stash here um, I mentioned that I wanted to knit something up in a nice dusky pink I had a perfect skein that was a candidate for that which is this yarn here this is by Earl Grey Fibre company it is their oolong dk in this gorgeous as i mentioned sort of slightly variegated dusky pink color and it is beautiful the color i believe is sweater weather which is perfect of course and it is a hundred percent superwash merino in the dk weight and i absolutely adore it now I am making a couple of changes to Jen's pattern. Jen, I'm sorry in advance, but these are tiny modifications that will just ensure that I get a lot of wear out of this. Now, part of it goes back to what I was saying earlier about cast-ons. One of the things that I, I do enjoy um, in terms of knitting, but it does sometimes annoy me in terms of wearing, the original Jenica hat that I have here is a long tail cast on. So back to cast ons and kind of how they look. If I hold this up for you to see, you should be able to see the cast on edge here is quite a distinct line that goes around the base of the hat. And while it is brilliant and perfect for being something that I can speedily get through and start working on very, very swiftly, I don't always love how it looks. It's quite a distinct kind of line at the start of a pattern. So I decided that I was gonna try and do something a little bit different. Now, I'm not gonna go into too much detail um, other than to say the way that Jen's pattern is written, an alternating cable cast on is a little bit complicated. A tubular cast on is potentially a little bit complicated because of the sequencing of the knits and the pearls. And so I decided I really wanted to do a folded 
brim and that would actually allow me to keep my ears super cozy and warm because this is a super wash DK and again it's not going to be as cozy as some of the woolier yarns but it's obviously lovely and soft so you know them's the balance and the breaks but I decided to do a folded brim and I'm a little bit into the pattern but this is how far I am so far so you can see how this is knitting up. The folded brim, as I mentioned, means that all the way under here, I have my ribbing. So this here, this line that you can see here is actually where I cast on. I then knit double the length of ribbing required, folded that cast on edge inside, and then knit the knits and purled the purls as necessary in the pattern to then knit through both the front, so this side of the fabric, and indeed the original cast on edge to create this lovely folded brim. And it is going to be so unbelievably squishy and cosy, just to squish it is so much fun. Um, but yeah, as I mentioned, this is a beautiful cabled pattern. You can see those cables starting to materialise and for all that it's a slightly variegated yarn, I do think they still stand out fairly prominently. The colourway is beautiful, it's working fabulously well with the pattern. As I mentioned, I do love knitting on higher higher needles for hats. These are higher highers in the 16 inch length and it is a 4 millimetre. Jen actually writes this pattern for a slightly larger needle size. I believe she recommends a four and a half, which is a US size seven for the main body of the hat itself. Because I'm using DK weight yarn, I actually decided to opt for the four millimeter, which is six, uh, US size six needle, and instead just knit the largest size. So I cast on for the largest size. I'm knitting the largest stitch count at the moment, but I will probably, in terms of length, work towards the um, specifications for the medium sized hat. That is what I did with this version here. And um, it fits me really rather nicely. So yes, I think I'm probably going to be about bang on in terms of yardage. I may be playing it a little bit fast and loose with this, but I reckon in terms of yardage, I should be fine. I think I've got about kind of half the skein remaining to knit the remainder of the hat. And obviously the closer I get to the top, the more likely I am to be knitting fewer stitches. That is how hats work. Um, and so, yeah, or most hats. Some hats just have you knit all the stitches and then cinch it in at the end, but then you end up with this big bunchy weirdness at the top of your head, which is not my personal preference. Um, but yes, so I am going to be carrying on knitting on this and very much enjoying it. So hopefully I should have something to share with you in the not too distant future. In terms of pom-poms, because I mean, obviously pom-poms, I do have a few more um, in my stash from Cowling Country Crafts. I will be having a little hunt through there to see if I can find a suitably shaded one. It will probably be a sort of beigey brownie neutral, maybe a grey, I will have a bit of a think as to what is going to work best with these colours, but I'm really enjoying it so far. The other thing that I've been working on over the last few weeks is going back to my Rhinebeck cast on. So those of you who will have watched in previous episodes were, I mean, I hesitate to say kind of bemused, but, but certainly surprised by the fact that I opted to cast on a pair of socks. I am not the biggest sock knitter by any stretch of the imagination, um, and yet here we are. Uh, so in the run-up to Rhinebeck, I decided that I was going to take some socks with me as plain knitting. I cast those on and I finished the first one while I was out there. I have shown that previously, but just as a reminder, here it is. This is a sock. It is a 64 stitch sock knit on a 2.25 millimeter needle, which is, we looked at this last time, a US one and a half, I think. Hang on. It's a US one. You get dispensation for that one. So a US one, which is a 2.25 millimeter needle. And um, I knit the main body of the sock using yarn from Dusty Dimples, who is a wonderful dyer based here in the UK. This is her sock base, which is a merino nylon blend in the You Can Find Me in Cuba colorway. And then the heel toe and cuff 
are leftovers from my Hey Sister Yarn Co, uh, their Geronimo Sock Base, which is an 80-20 merino nylon blend in the Drizzle colorway. Unfortunately, Hey Sister Yarn Co are no longer dying, um, but I couldn't resist using this little gold accent to bring out some of the gold of the sock itself. I will hold it up for you to see it in all of its glory. Here we go. You can see these fabulous colours and how they play together. It has a little bit of the gingerbread house about it, I will say. I think part of that is due to the colours I've used to accent, but I do think even just the kind of pinks and the creams coming through, it makes me feel a little bit kind of um, sort of pseudo festive, let's call it that. But um, yes, yeah, so I have finished my first sock, which I've picked up. Um, which I finished off when I was at Rhinebeck. The second sock now has a heel, yes indeed. Uh, the heel is a Fish Lips Kiss heel. It is a pattern I really enjoy using. I did also add a couple of extra increases here and I'm then doing some decreases. This is because um, in terms of my foot, I have quite a deep heel. So the kind of heel to the bridge of my foot here is quite um, quite deep, quite a large circumference. And so I wanted to give myself a little bit of extra wriggle room, so to speak. So it's gonna be a little bit hard to see, but let me hold it up and see if I can get the camera to focus. So you might be able to see just here, there's a little line of increases that I've made on either side just before the heel. And then just immediately after it, I've got this little line here of decreases, just adding in three extra stitches on each side here. So six in total, one here, one on the other side here, uh, and then decreasing those on the way back after the heel. Um, I do really like the fish lips, his, fish lips kiss heel. It is probably my personal preference, partly because I remember how to do it, which if I'm honest is, is at least half the battle with me, um, but also because I find it fits really quite nicely, that little kind of width issue notwithstanding. Um, but yeah, so I have powered on through that heel, I now just have the foot to knit, and then the toe, which will be knit to match this version here. Uh, in terms of my toes, I tend to do it I think it's a rounded toe, I'm not totally sure on the um, terminology, but essentially I will knit uh, for the first four decreases, I'll do them two, knits, uh, two rows of plain and then one row with decreases, two rows plain, one with decreases, I'll do that four times, I will then decrease every other row four times and then I will decrease every row four times, so roughly um, kind of 20-ish rounds, I think, or 18-ish rounds uh, of knitting on the toes. So that is how I do my toes. Um, but yeah, there we have it. Socks ahoy. So um, I will hope to have those done in the next few weeks. I am undecided if these are for me or if they are going to be a gift knit. I am still just gently considering. I know clearly these are my colours, um, but I also know that a very good friend of mine had looked upon them with joy and delight, and we'll see, we'll see. We'll see how nice a person I end up being at the end of the day. This is the thing with gift knitting. Usually it starts with the intention of being for me and ends up being gifted. That's how I do gift knitting. <laughs> it's how I get around the joy of being a selfish knitter, but there we go. So moving along from knitting this week, I mentioned I had some acquisitions. We've talked about them a little bit. Um, yeah. <laughs> so in buying that last skein of lipstick from Jill Draper's online shop, it was only fair that it was kept company with these beauties that also made their way across the pond. So when I have five skeins, uh, also of the Mini Empire base, which I absolutely adore, but this time it is in her leaf colourway and just, it's stunning. So on the off chance you haven't really experienced this in all of its heathered beauty, let me hold it up and you'll be able to see it here. It is heathery and gorgeous. It is rambouillet wool, which means it is dense and yet snuggly and huge. We have talked about this. Um, but yeah, I absolutely adore this base. And so there is a very, very strong chance that this is going to become another Felix sweater because I'm a little bit obsessed with it, in all honesty. So um, yeah, five of these to make myself a complete Felix. 
Love it. No shame. I know I've just come back from Rhinebeck. I know I bought a load of stuff from Jill Draper when I was over at Rhinebeck, this included. And yet, here we are. Let's call it a Christmas present to myself, an early Christmas present to myself. That's what we're calling it. I do also have some pattern picks for you this week, certainly over the last few weeks, particularly as I was having a look through kind of different accessories, getting some ideas, having a look at alternative hat and cowl patterns, I stumbled across a few that I really wanted to share. The first of those is a beautiful hat pattern. It is called the Nevum hat and I'll put a picture of it up here on the screen for you to enjoy. This is from a designer who is new to me. Her name is Melina Hami, but it is an absolutely stunning pattern. It's for a kind of DK to worsted weight yarn. It's knit at quite a tight gauge. The pattern pictures on her page suggest it could be worn in a reversible way. So she has one picture where it's worn with the bubbles on the outside and another with it worn on the inside. And actually both look really, really nice. I just really love the mix of kind of different textures, different, um, I guess, kind of lace versus the bubbles. The, the look of the hat was something I really, really enjoyed. And I can imagine it would be an awful lot of fun to work up and to knit as well. It's the perfect size of a project where you want something that's maybe a little bit challenging or perhaps not going to be very kind of formulaic, but at the same time, this could kind of mix it up really, really nicely. As I mentioned, it's kind of a worsted to DK weight. So a really good little hat knit that will keep you warm over winter, but potentially, if you are so inclined, could be a great gift knit as well. Or do what I do, start knitting it for yourself and then end up giving it away because you're actually a good person, really deep down sometimes. This is also the time of year when cowls start to come back on my radar. Now, I bloody love a cowl and yet I very rarely knit them. And I just think it's because it feels like a really big hat sometimes. <laughs> and my attention span doesn't always go quite that far, but they are incredibly practical. I do need to get the sizing of them right though. It either needs to be something that fits around once and is reasonably sort of close fitting without being snug, or it's something that I can wrap around twice. It, there's a balance there that needs to be found. In terms of one uh, cowl that definitely fits the bill for the first of those, so something that'll fit quite nicely, it is the Cedar Veil vale Cowl, and this is a pattern by Isabetti Knits. It was one that I saw on Instagram initially, and then had to scramble to have a look at it over on Ravelry, because I really, really love the look of this. It's something that, again, it's quite cabled, it's got a little bit of ribbing on either side, it would be just just enough to keep your interest kind of peaked the whole way through. And again, should you really wish it to, it could be a very strong gift knit as well. It's also worsted weight, so again, could be something that knits up fairly swiftly, and it looks like it should take around about one skein of yarn. So in terms of yardage, it's around about 180 to 200 yards. So should be something that, to be honest, most of the yarn that I have in these two shelves here is DK weight and worsted, so I would definitely be able to find something for a contender for it in there. But again, really, really lovely pattern. It's knit in the round, it uses four and 4.5 millimeter needles, so a six and a seven from a US perspective. And again, I think it would be a great contender for a lovely winter woolly pattern. Another cowl that caught my eye is the Promenade Cowl. This is a pattern by Sloan Rosenthal. I'll put it up here on the screen as well. This is actually part of the collection that is launching the Hudson West yarn line. Now, Hudson West is a new yarn line that I actually picked up when I was in the US at Rhinebeck. So the beautiful golden green, I think it's gold leaf colorway that I picked up, not the nest worsted from magpie that is more olivey because we established this in the post Rhinebeck episode they are definitely different colors <laughs> they just look very similar um yeah the hudson west line is a beautiful kind of just squishy woolly wool yarn that i picked up when i was over at Rhinebeck. this yarn here or rather this pattern here makes use of that base 
and it just looks beautiful. This feels more like a slightly bigger cowl that you'd need to either kind of knit long enough that you could double wrap it or potentially kind of have it as a big single wrap folded over as they've done in the styling shots here. But either way, it just looks really bloody snuggly and I love the look of it. Again, quite simple with ribbing and a little bit of cabling in there as well. Something that could be knit in a lovely neutral or potentially something that's a bit more kind of statement and bold, depending on your wish. This, while it's knit with worsted weight yarn, is actually knit with two strands of worsted weight held together to make it into a bulky weight. So snuggly as fuck, I believe is the technical term. <laughs> But, oh, could you, could you imagine how cosy that's going to be? Um, but yes, yeah, so it will be two skeins or, or two um, worsted yarns held together. As such, the yardage is a little bit more. It's around about the 600, 700 yard mark. So round about three, three and a half skeins-ish. Um, but yeah, oh, just it's going to be so cosy. And the good news too is because it's all held together, it's knit on a six millimeter needle, which is a US size 10, which means it is gonna be fast to work up as well. So definitely, definitely an option for if you're urgently on the lookout for something nice and cozy and snuggly up at your neck in the chillier wind. So that's the inspiration that has been serving up some ideas to me within the last couple of weeks. But in all honesty, the single greatest source of inspiration has been all of the work that you are doing as part of the Blame Dunder Knit Along. Again, I will mention this until the end of January, but the Blame Dunder Knit Along is a make along that embraces all types of crafts, whether it be knitting, whether it be crochet, whether it be calligraphy, whether it be stitching, whether it be embroidery, whether it be sewing, anything that takes your fancy. Um, but what it is, is it is a make along that allows you to work on whatever your little heart desires. This is a time of year that is so readily full of obligations and things that, you know, stresses that we put on ourselves, stresses that society or kind of family put on us potentially. And so it's an opportunity for us to take a moment and work on something that makes us very happy. And if that means that you are enabled into purchasing a little cheeky yarn present to yourself or indeed just to cast on something while the gift knits and the other works in progress sit idly by, feel free to do so and feel free to make me take all of that accountability on my own shoulders for you. For this make along, there are a few different ways that you can engage with it. We do have prize packages. Those are still being worked up. I will share those in the coming weeks. But for the main part, it's all about engaging and taking part. And so there are three ways where you can go about winning prizes. You can do that by chatting along in the Ravelry group, which is linked in the show notes below. You can enter in your FOs in our FO thread in the Ravelry group again, please be aware it is one entry per person. Please go and edit that original entry for every new FO that you produce, should you be overachieving enough to produce more than one as part of this cal. And then the third way that you can do it is of course by entering over on Instagram by using the blame dunder knit along hashtag, which I will place here on the screen if my editing brain allows me to remember that. But the great news is that as ever, I have found a just, I was going to say snippet because in all honesty, like the using the hashtags, looking at the groups, just the, the wealth of inspiration and skill and expertise and creativity and just passion that you guys are putting into these projects makes me so happy. And so it's always such a wrench to try and choose just a handful to show on each episode. I have chosen some projects that caught my eye over on Instagram over the last few weeks and therefore I will be sharing those with you now as part of our Blame Dunder Knit Along Calorie.
They are absolutely stunning, I am sure you can agree. There are, I mean, the How Cold Is It Mittens have been on my radar for a very long time and will need to happen at some point, I am quite sure. But um, it just tickles me so much that you are using this opportunity to cast on the things that your hearts desire and are taking so much joy from doing exactly that. Honestly, I just, I love this knit along and make along so very much. And it's mostly because of the time and the energy that you all put into it. So thank you so much for sharing those. Please continue to do so. And if there's anything else that strikes your fancy, feel free to cast on with Wild Abandon. You have until the end of January and you do by no means need to finish everything that you cast on. I'm just saying, I'm just saying. <laughs> But that is it for this week's episode of Knitting Vicariously. As I mentioned, you may well see me in the coming days popping up the occasional vlog in the run-up to Vlogmas and indeed the festive season. Um, I really do hope you enjoy them if you choose to engage. If you don't and Vlogmas isn't your thing, I totally get it. Rest assured that podcasts will be continuing as normal as well. But in the meantime, it really only remains for me to say thank you as ever so, so much for watching. I wish you a wonderful rest of day, rest of week. I hope your knitting is keeping you happy and fulfilled. But if for whatever reason it isn't, I do hope you have the opportunity to knit vicariously. Keep on keeping on. On and I will see you again very, very soon. Bye. Yes, even here at Knitting Vicariously, we are adorning our shop. Oh, fuck. Oh no. This is where the crazy comes to bear. So, um, yeah, here's the thing. So I spent a good 20 minutes stringing up these lights today. They were a bit of a fucker to put up. There's quite a lot of blue tack that is like the wizard behind the curtain that's happening on here. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, um, it's fine. I spent quite a lot of time doing it and it's only just occurred to me. This is, right, appreciate the crazy, please. I know some of you will get it. Um, I've done them the wrong way round. So at the top I've got hats and mitts. At the bottom I've got socks. My sock yarn's on the top shelf and my accessories yarn's on the middle shelf and I want my socks to go underneath the sock yarn and then the hats and mitts to go underneath the hats and mitts. That is very upsetting. <laughs> I'm gonna have to change it. I, I shouldn't need to change it. I'm a grown woman. I should be able to just live with it and just be like, it's fine. I'm probably gonna need to change it. <laughs> and, uh, you get it, right? You get it, yeah. No, I'm just a weirdo. <laughs>